It is March the 27th, 2021, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography We're back. Well, the three of us, Adrian, Jeremiah, Hello. and myself. Hello. How's everyone doing? We're good. Not bad, thank you. Not bad. Not too bad. Um, no. And today is the episode that we've been talking about for uh, weeks now, but haven't really gotten around to. But now it's about time to dive deep into crypto and NFTs, non-fungible yeah. tokens. Um, yeah. Is there... <laughs> where do there, we begin? Well, wh where do we begin <laughs> and why is it a thing? And I think we should probably just start with explaining what is that thing. Because NFTs are everywhere right now. There's a pretty big hype about them. Um, I have the suspicion that we're in the typical hype curve, which is like it's, it's going to dive sooner or later and then it'll probably come back to a normal level in, in a few years from now. But right now it's like the thing. It is the thing. And just, just you know, in case anybody doesn't recognize the term, um, mm -hmm. a JPEG sold for $69 million. Yes. How can that be a thing? <laughs> How well, can that be a thing? Let's, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Let's, let's talk gonna, about fungibility. Let's, let's talk about what is, fun, what is fungibility and what is a token. I think, I think these two terms, we need to define those first, right? Yes, and what what I also uh, think is a way of prologue is there is so much media news hype, realism, uh, historical moves, political, economic, social uh, that are all affected and will infect, affect, and be um, relevant to the world of blockchain technology. And so, what we don't want to do is. Uh, make this uh, particular episode uh, explaining everything about the technology of blockchain. There is so much value out there that does a much better job than we can. We won't be able we'll to do it anyway, you know. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, you know, I've been uh, down a rabbit hole after rabbit hole, um, and I, I'm still trying to climb up. But every time I make a step up, I find another branch and it leads me uh, astray. Um, a fungibility and non-fungibility are at, at the basic um, instruction level, which is a fungible token is very simply um, a store of value that is interchangeable with its equivalent store of value. So, I so have a dollar, to, you have a dollar. Exactly. The one dollar doesn't matter if the one dollar was in a in a bank heist or the other one was in a in a laundromat. They are worth the same. They are exchangeable, right? So that That's is fungible. Right. So what does yeah. non fungible mean? My dog and your dog are not fungible. They're both dogs. But if I gave you my dog and you gave me your dog, we wouldn't have the same attachment, value, ownership. Uh, or the same and, dog. <laughs> no, they're not the same dog. They're both dogs. But obviously, each of those dogs have an emotional connection of value for us that yep. cannot be divided. And that, that makes that dog a non-fungible item. Mm -hmm. And when you... When you apply uh, tokenization, which is a uh, basically a mathematical representation of one's ability to create a contract of ownership, of value, recurring value, uh, that token represents whatever it is we want to put out there uh, for sale or giving. That's that. That's the most basic explanation so of. Funny. Is it is it correct to say that though that the, the the buying and selling of the token has got no relation to the ownership of the item that the token represents? The the item is not itself. So the 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 thing that you wrap a token around or you represent with a token is is not impacted at all by this. And actually, what you're buying and selling is just the token. No, you're well, you're buying the token, but the token uh, in the ethereum blockchain and now we're starting to slide into how the technology works but 
the Ethereum blockchain is capable of creating smart contracts. Each of these contracts are um, available for public viewing on the blockchain. They are not centralized, they are decentralized, and they are manifest on thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of computers, which all have the same ledger. And that ledger uh, carries all the instructions that are attached to that token and that token, uh, what that token represents. So for example, if I say uh, there is a token um, object or or let's say virtual object, a, a uh, digital piece of art, uh, that token represents your ownership, could represent your ownership of it. And uh, so that ownership itself is value for you because you, you could sell it, you could trade it, you could keep it, you could, you could uh, certainly uh, manifest it in an online gallery, see it on a screen. Now, the value of that is very similar to, let's just say, the Mona Lisa, often used as examples. You know, the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre, but we could go within two seconds, any of us could go online and see an image of the Mona Lisa in books, in co on coffee cups, t-shirts, whatever. But the value of the Mona Lisa, it, the ownership of that painting is within the walls of the Louvre. So there's a very different uh, dynamic between those who own it and those who are able to see it. Now, the value of the Mona Lisa is enormous because it's a one of a kind and it was produced by a famous artist. But let's just say that, that some young student discovers that, you know, the Mona Lisa actually wasn't painted <laughs> by, by Leo. It was painted by Harvey, his cousin, the value of that painting will immediately drop. The, uh, the, the experience of the image won't be different, but the value of it will be different. So when we're talking about creating tokens of art, and that's what we've kind of slid into, that token represents the possibility of owning something not unlike a baseball card or um, any amount of, of memorabilia that is circulating in our uh, world. It's just a, uh, a store of value. So, so when, when we're looking at digital art being linked or represented by a token, um, in theory, we could, we could take this very podcast episode the file, the MP3, and put this in, turn this into an NFT or link it with an NFT and then um, assign it some value and then possibly could, sell we, that token if we wanted to, if someone was willing to buy it. Is that correct? That's right. That, that is absolutely correct. The, the value is only relative to what somebody will pay for it. And even then, is that the true value? Because value is determined not only by one's ability to buy something, but one's ability to sell that very thing. So, yeah, um, you know, Beeple's uh, J JPEG, which, you know, arguably is 5,000 JPEGs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's like it's like ten years or more of daily. Yeah, fifteen years of daily work of daily so work that he put in there. So it's it's an enormous amount of work, but and it was purchased for sixty eight million dollars. Uh, if that person turned around and wanted to sell it, but there were no bids on it or bids for ten dollars, what is the true value of the of the Beeple NFT? So. We're so early in this world in terms of uh, investing or speculating about art. And it, it should always come back to, if you look at these markets, and, and there are many, one should only, I think, buy a work of art if one feels a connection to it, if it really is affordable and one loves it. And then it doesn't matter if it climbs in value or decreases in value, it's yours and, and, and you get that emotional connection 
uh, because it represents who you are. That's why trading sports cards and now sports NFTs have become so popular. It's because people want that quarterback, center, star soccer player. They want a piece of that. They want that that kind of um, memory to be uh, in some way tokenized so that it is a representation of personality, of, 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 of expression, like fashion. So would, would it be fair to say that, um, at least in the context of digital works of art, that um, this would be the first time in history that a digital piece of art can be kind of a unique thing? Because that is the inherent problem of a JPEG or an MP3, that you can copy it without... Um, without a trace it's the, the 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 copy is as good as the original and that's one of the issues with digital art in general even photography that um, you the reproducibility kind of takes value out of it it's a very very interesting uh, question is do we buy uh, works of art because we want to create a scarce value so no one can see it. Like, I think there's a, a statistic that is, I, I w won't quote it uh, without knowing exactly, but it's an overwhelming amount of the world's art is stored in Switzerland in vaults never to be seen. It's just there as a hedge against inflation. <laughs> And so um, owning something, presenting something, displaying something, those are all very different things. And even though um, I could say, you know, I love a Cartier-Bresson image when I see it on screen or in a book, if I own a Cartier-Bresson print that's on my wall, I have a different connection. That Cartier-Bresson print is maybe more meaningful to me as owner of it. It connects me to the artist a little bit stronger. And that's why you have musicians, um, like Blau, you have visual artists uh, who are coming in, sports figures who are coming into this. These are all people who have some kind of following that reaches beyond just a middleman, but directly to the audience. And that tokenization can be very profitable for those people and they're coming in. And that's why we have this rush and bubble and frothiness in the market. And, and normally these frothy markets take about 18 months to settle down. But because of the speed um, onto which this occurred, I mean, it is like unbelievable. If you just look at, I think the first NFT really was published in or minted in 2017, as I recall. But it didn't really become a thing before 2019. And then we have the pandemic. We have people locked in exploring and having explore. plenty of time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to spend money <laughs> be crazy be virtual and we have this explosion of this uh, frothiness value v reminds me very much about the early days of the internet even in a way before the world wide web when we just had to do a little coding to get into research or universities and there was but there was this intense excitement about it people didn't really know where it would go exactly. Um, we thought, ah, oh, this is going to be beautiful for the world. It'll open up expression. And, and, and once we had mosaic kind of applied to it, so it was ease of use. And we're not there yet with, with um, uh, the, the kind of uh, blockchain technology. It, it still takes a very strong will and technical um, adeptness to move through it if you want to securitize your your wealth, because there's so many hucksters now in, there's so many um, strange things that are happening with any new markets. But I, I, I think, you know, within six to nine months, we're going to have a big correction. That correction is going to be very positive because that's going to assign true value to whatever can be minted as tokens and Uh, the main thing is that the blockchain technology itself will become uh, very um, controversial in terms of politics in some countries who are going to want digital 
and other countries who do not. And, and not so, not just yeah. politics. I mean, there's there's uh, always this strong critique that um, all these cryptos that this is based on uh, uh, take up an, an enormous amount of energy to keep them going. That's and a myth, though. I know it's a myth, but um, it is it is a, is a critique that you will hear left and right. Sure. Yeah. So Often can you the, can you explain why it's a myth then? Because I've heard that, and yeah. you know, and it seems you know at one level, if I'm being cynical, I think okay, so there's a there's a derivatives market here because you're not actually trading real things; you're trading digital tokens, and so yeah, they they may be linked to a supposed value in the real world, but they are not the thing. You're not selling the Mona Lisa; you're selling uh, a, 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 some ones and zeros that are linked to a to a, a vision of the Mona Lisa, and so if you're if all that's happening is you're running a, de a highly volatile derivatives market and it's chewing up loads of uh, environmental resources, then, then that sounds like a bad thing. No, it's different. Uh, your your token is basically a contract. Basically, it's a certificate of ownership, and and you could that certificate of ownership could ascribe any number of circumstances to your ability to use it, publish it, reuse it, or just look at it in your own home. And, and you would be liable. Copyright uh, is very, very, um, uh, it applies here. It's not, not any different. But that's a very different question that, uh, that you had, uh, you know, when it comes down to economics, politics, what we were just so, so that's interesting because from my own very much not down the rabbit hole research so i'm asking because you clearly know more about it than i do um just the the beeple thing in particular uh he uh i i have seen uh interview an interview with him in fact it was in my pick of the week last week which chris actually unearthed in the first place where he says that what he has sold for 68 million dollars is absolutely not the copyright it is a token that he has sold and the token comes with no rights to own the imagery. Um, all, it, all the purchaser has purchased, has, has speculated upon, is the token itself and a rather nice little gift box that it comes in. <laughs> well, yes and no. The, the work itself is, is going to be presented in a a virtual VR um, museum, shall we say, that it will be constructed in what is known as the metaverse, which is the subject for another <laughs> episode. Uh, imagine Second Life, but, you know, Second Life 2.9. Right, know what I mean? okay. Um, so a virtual reality world of some sort then. That's right. And the right. creators of this world, the speculators who have made a lot of money in building wallets and selling virtual land, this is where they made their money. They're Singaporean and they, they bought the people. And they, could you imagine the amount of publicity that that $60 million brought them? So as a, mar as, as a marketing expenditure, I think it's a triumph because the people who stand to make money out of this incredibly volatile market are the people that are actually fueling the price increases, which is fantastic because they, they might get to sell that token. It's a bit for like it's a hundred bit like million in, dollars. in the gold rush where the people who sold the shovels made most of the money. I think, ah, it's, I think go, it's called yes. a py right? pyramid scheme. I think it's called, well, isn't it? <laughs> You could, but also we could describe that same pyramid scheme to our present governments and how they mint money as well. I mean, that's another, again another topic so, for another day. And another now that's show. a really. No, uh, do you know what I was? I was hoping that somebody would mention that, and I was thinking to mention it myself because, of course, the money that I have—I don't have any money. I haven't used <laughs> cash in a year. Um, but the the money that I used to spend, of course, is 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 a promissory note, and and in this country, in my country, it says you know the 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 Bank of England promises to be, pay the bearer so and so many pounds, whatever it says on the face of the note. So it is a promissory note, although legally that is simply not the case in the UK anymore. You cannot anymore take a note to the Bank of England and get paid an equivalent amount of gold. That doesn't happen anymore. Nor um, here. <laughs> Uh, so, 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 yeah, but that's, uh, so, so is that, um, you, you're exchanging effectively a piece of paper for something that is a tangible good, uh, aren't you? Um, 
which it's is fungible. It's it's a fungible good. It had that that value of one pound, one mark, one dollar has value because we all agree it has value. It's not ascribed to a solid piece of value, and even gold. Yeah, is, is, although, is although relatively, it's, it's uh, ubiquity makes it slightly different, though, doesn't it? Because if everybody uses it as just a way of, you know. Um, facilitating what otherwise would be a complex bartering mechanism. Yeah, 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 yeah. you've got some cut. Yeah, it's it's greasing the wheels, isn't it? But um, I, uh, so difference. There's a difference. Yeah, there is a difference. I think Bitcoin, in particular, uh, has a ceiling uh, mint of twenty one million. So there will be no more Bitcoins. I think there are 18 million in circulation now. There's going to be 21. And they, they, again, there's there's every 240,000 transactions, there's a halving, for, you know, I, again, this is, I, I don't also, I may sound like I know what I'm uh, talking about, <laughs> but uh, I'm literally, this is just like stream of consciousness of what I'm trying to figure out for myself and bring it back to, us as artists, but um, so here's the acid test, Jeremiah. Have you minted an NFT yet and assigned it to one of your pieces of work? Uh, I've produced quite a lot, but I am not at the point where I understand which market is best for my work. Okay, and there are you know maybe six or seven that are more or less good for. The kind of work that I do, uh, and number two, gas prices are significant. And by gas prices, those are the costs of uh, pushing the your transactions onto the blockchain, and mm. those transaction fees are the very thing that gets the um, those computer nodes, those people who are running those, paid in small amounts. So, um, because there's so much uh, movement onto these blockchains and so much, uh, so many transactions happening per second, the costs of minting them are uh, a little higher than I'd like to have in order to price my work right. If I sell a work for say sixty dollars and it costs me sixty dollars to to mint it and somebody, it costs them $60 to buy it and $60 to transact, feels kind of not right. It's much better if I charge, say, $3,000 for a $60 mintable. So <laughs> what I'm trying to do is figure out the balance of gas prices relative to value and ascribe it to the right market at the right time. And then Again, do I want to be jumping into a frothy market or do I want to wait till real value transacts? So that's, yeah, that's an interesting thing because, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but as I understand it, if, if you are an artist rather than a technical person, you can pay, you, you can pay somebody to mint you a token. And, and and that is the yeah the the gas price that you were referring to. Most mm. a, a lot of that money, I believe, goes to the the technical person who sometimes is referred to as a miner, somebody who who is causing computers to do work because the way that the blockchains you know recognise that something has been mined is that you need a proof of how much compute work has actually been done. Uh, so, um, so I'm guessing from your what you're describing, there, you, your experience as as an artist in this case, rather than as the technical side, you, you have paid, presumably through some marketplace, for somebody to mint you a token, and some no. miners have gone away and have had some computers to do work, have they? It does. It doesn't exactly work like that. Oh, okay. For example, minting a token. If I wanted to put, say, just a simple image on Rarible's, which have the kind of I think the currently the easiest way of getting a work up there. Uh, they are not, uh, they don't filter by artists or style. Uh, what I would do is minting really means uh, uploading the image or a, rep or, or a, let's say your final image is, you know, 50 megabytes, but you, you'd put a 10 megabyte or a smaller image up as a representation of what you're selling. The upload 
into the blockchain of that or onto the market, which then puts the token onto the blockchain, mm -hmm. is the minting process. Uh, okay. To get it on to the blockchain costs money. That money is spread out to those who are validating, in, in terms of Ethereum, your transaction on every level. So every single transaction is entered into 100,000 ledgers or how many it is. I don't know what it is today. Or, um, and they all ascribe to a very specific token or coin, an Ether, though there are I don't know how many. Many. Many, many, many different ones. Each one have a different, some have different blockchains, some work on the Ethereum blockchain. Bitcoin is its own thing. So you can see this is, this is not like something that we're and just nobody like, is, oh yeah. Nobody's stopping you from coming up with your own crypto, your own token. So uh -huh. um, this is a, this is, it is a, it's a confusing thing for most people. I'm going to also address the, the electricity issue is very, very interesting because right. what you have also in, in many, many countries is this encouragement to find cheaper and cheaper electricity. So you find countries that have a lot of hydroelectric power, for example, uh, countries that have a lot of solar excess uh, are, are creating massive uh, computer um I guess, farms that are mining these or validating these and using very cheap electricity. So it's having, in, in an odd way, inverse effect, there is a global focus on finding the cheapest, most sustainable um, electricity that is possible because that increases the value of the mining and validating on the blockchain. So you have a... a sort of a reverse push. Now, you know, those computers, that electricity, is it going to be like if I'm mining here in California with very high electricity costs? Yeah. But, um, I, you know, again, I, Iceland, you know, oh, uh, Venezuela. I, Iceland, Iceland has, has, has actually put out uh, official incentives for mining farms yes. to come to Iceland because electricity right. there is super cheap. cheap because of the geothermal if i would be, be mining in, in my basement um i would pay more electricity than what's coming out from the mining so it wouldn't be exactly me, uh, it wouldn't me work too. here it i wouldn't be able to do it uh, in any economic way so so the reverse is that it's it's a good myth to say oh it uses a lot of electricity and coal and oil and whatnot but in fact it really drives an incentive financially to use sustainable and cheap electricity not to use oil and coal base or natural gas base. So that's just an aside. Um, mm, in terms okay. of value and how it works with uh, individual photography, which I think we should get to. <laughs> <laughs> this is the future of photography after all. <laughs> and, and this is very much involved in the future of photography. How do we tokenize a still image? And is a tokenized image, a minted still photo, um, Does that have the special sauce that works in a uh, blockchain environment? Because most that you see are, you know, 3D art. I'm just talking art right now. 3D art, uh, animated art, uh, generative art, um, those kinds of more um, creations that are attractive to those who live online, who uh, are very influenced by the pop culture of online VR, AR viewing, and they embrace that. And, and I think that is an explosion uh, of artists who can actually get their work out without being filtered right now through major museums and galleries. I mean, I, I kind of fear that the same kind of thing that happens in every market will happen again, and you're going to have the Museum of Modern Art coming in to tokenize their work, and big galleries are going to be doing the same thing. Well, why wouldn't you if you could make money off it? I mean, if you're a gallery and you... Well, sure. You know, well, let's go back to the Louvre, right? Because they, they have the Mona Lisa. What if they were to mint a token that represented the Mona Lisa and they yeah. could sell it for millions of dollars? Or well, euros in their case, I suppose. Um, that would be, you know, and they, you know, they'd have the money and they'd still have the Mona Lisa. That's 
Well, they, they would in person, and you may be able to say, I own a piece of the Mona Lisa. But wait, so, so is the, can I ask about that then? Because this is, this is the, you, you mentioned these, these smart contracts. Um, you know, I, I had a very clear message from the Beeple stuff that, you know, he has not sold any copyright. There's been no transfer of copyright for the 5,000 JPEG piece. Um, and that all he has sold is a token and so all the buyer has bought is a token and uh, not the piece of artwork and that, that none no rights have uh, in the artwork have transferred it's only the rights in the token that have transferred is that something that is, i guess could you write us one of these contracts that that does assign copyright or yeah, does I, assign some other I, rights or publishing I, rights absolutely, or something absolutely absolutely right. for for example in the people world let, let's just say I take a, um, I make a huge painting of Mickey Mouse and I adjust it and I, you know, I change it and I put a mustache on it and I transgender him and, you know, I, but, it, but it's clearly Mickey Mouse. And I paint it and I hang it in a gallery. Uh, it'd be very difficult for Disney to win a lawsuit over a single painting that hangs, that is a social commentary on the Disneyfication or the metaphor of Mickey Mouse. If I took that image and published it uh, as a Coca-Cola ad, they could, because I don't own the copyright. I, I have the ability, in certainly in America, to transform work, if they're transformed significantly, uh, I have the ability of saying and claiming that it is mine. But that doesn't mean I get to exploit it uh, at the, you know, at the behest of whatever um, I deem profitable for myself. So, People's work can be seen or will be seen in this virtual, virtual gallery, but the individual images that he has taken cannot be exploited, resold, or published for gain. And that's, that's the difference. I could, however, create an NFT of an image of mine and say, you can buy this for a dollar and you have all rights you know what I mean? Totally non-exclusive, and you can do with it as you want. So it's in the that. T's and C's, then. You could do that. You could you could put whatever you want into that contract. Okay. But if you claim to have copyright and sell it based on uh, the copyright, then you're you know you're targeted for uh, breach, for infringement. Right. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? It it does, and I, it it does, and I can see then because you know before the the current spike in interest in NFTs. I mean, we had talked before on this podcast about using blockchain technology to protect copyright and to you know so that you, know, you could attach a, a an image or or a something to a blockchain and, and therefore you could prove that it was your your work. And and that that's been I mean you know it's, it's a little while ago I forget which show number it was that we that we had that conversation or maybe we've had it more than once I don't know, <laughs> and, but it's certainly something that we have spoken about and so th this is what I get I guess we're getting I I'm getting slightly confused slightly twisted around the axle it's like well what are we selling here you know are we selling just you know smoke and mirrors or are we selling something and i guess maybe it, it's in the terms of the contract that you set that you ask the artist determine what to sell yeah okay. yes and also it's no different than selling work traditionally in galleries that are you know in molecules and atoms you know there's there's hype there's you know ascribed val assigned value there's scarcity there's you know, all of these things that museums and galleries go through, um, you know, currently, you know, I have a gallery here in Los Angeles, but, you know, um, I was going to meet before, just before the pandemic with galleries in New York and my mentor advisor, one of the big dealers here in, uh, in LA uh, had recommended that I do not do that. That what I do is, and he was arranging a, sequence of meetings with curators, museum curators, 
for shows like I've had in South America, uh, which are presented not for commercial purposes, just hung in museums for, you know, for the experience of people. And then the galleries will start to kind of come to you because the value was bumped by the museum. And so, you know, you have the battle of the middlemen here. And of course, you know, in a gallery, everything you sell, 50% goes off the top. In the NFT world on these markets, number one, you ascribe the value and you can put that, you can make a hard value. Uh, you can create as many in your edition as you wish. Um, you could also basically create an open edition. So as many, any, everyone wants to buy this. There's like, you know, they're 10 bucks, and but put a time on it. In other words, from, you know, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. on this date, it's an open edition, 10 bucks, and then it's closed, never to be sold again. So you have different, you know, different approaches. You have, I'm going to do 50 different variations like bubblegum cards, you know what I mean, of an image and put it up as a collection and say, I'll bundle three of these cards in every NFT, but I'll hide one special card in all of my bundles. And that special card could be ascribed to a real image, a token, a car, you know, whatever you want. And um, it's fascinating. And what I find fascinating is um, you could think that, oh, this is the crypto kids. This is like some playground thing going on. But if you look at how the Beeple auction went, that was auctioned off by Christie's, a very exactly. traditional brick and mortar action house that uh, auction yes. house that that is is clearly rooted in the old world and um they have auctioned that yeah. off so it there, there is there is different um different worlds coming together yes, uh, in this are. which and is well super interesting Sotheby, by the way saw the bees next week of course doing the same of course thing. Yeah. What, what are they what so, are they going to auction do you know but by the way that's <laughs> why the whole uh, I'm not going to say it's a battle, but the confusion of like banking here in America, banks and proper investment cannot play in cryptocurrency like at all. So you're you're starting to see these pressures on these uh, investment banks to create um, ETFs, bundles, baskets of 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 tokenized value or of you know Bitcoin cryptocurrency. And what's interesting is you have this dynamic that is between the fiat currencies and the digital currencies. And there is a push-pull here that we are just starting to experience. And whether we like it or not, this is coming. Like when I play with my granddaughter, this is a quick aside. Uh, she's seven. And she is really deep into a game called Roblox. Hmm. And she said yeah, my half the that. people in America under 10 are playing Roblox. And Roblox is like people build stuff and they sell stuff and they trade stuff and you buy coins and it's just been IPO'd. And she would rather spend 10 Roblox bucks on an on a outfit for her character then buy a doll and dress it up. She, she, her aesthetic, her, 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 her culture, and her, the culture of her friends is very much in the uh, virtual world, in the digital world. You know? Yeah, we have that uh, in our house. <laughs> um, my kids want to spend their real-world pocket money on digital currencies to well, spend in these games you know yeah. as, a, as a kid I, I i spent money on stickers to put in a booklet that you would yeah. collect i mean that's sure from, from, yeah, yeah. from, from, from an adult perspective well. that's not worth anything so no and that's uh, a, so there's a thing there isn't I it because because yeah. you're buying an experience in some ways aren't you because yes. yeah i used to but i used to buy it out I used to buy, I used to save up my pocket money to spend on computer games. Um, yeah. I, and I went down to the local shop and bought them on a cassette. And I took them home and, and put them in a cassette player for my computer. And lo and behold, we played computer games. Nowadays, entrance is free, but you have to pay. It's the, it's the freemium thing, isn't it? You have to pay to upgrade rather than pay at the door, as it were. So I don't really have a problem with 
uh, my, my, I don't really have a problem with my kids spending some of their money. It is more difficult. Having said that, the, you do have to be more wary because because there are unlimited opportunities to pay more money rather than oh, I bought it up front. Um, then well, yeah. you do have to be you do have to be <laughs> careful there. So I've got no problem with that yeah. as such. Um, uh, I I I I'm. I'm struggling with the whole NFT thing now because, and maybe because it is in the it is in the hype curve. I don't know, but I'm struggling with what lies beneath it. But then maybe I'm the same as the merchant in the 17th century who was looking at the original Dutch bankers and and whichever one of the French kings it was that set you know started using promissory notes and and saying, well, this isn't real, is it? It's the Empress New Clothes. Yeah. <laughs> As and, I began my journey, by the way, yeah. So somebody did, you, did tell me, try to explain Bitcoin to somebody in the 14th century. Well, try try to explain it to most people <laughs> nowadays, and it will be very difficult. Yeah. So, um, so uh, tell, tell me this, Jeremiah: Did you get anywhere with uh, anywhere in your research with um, geopolitical concerns or considerations or, or attitudes? Because, of course. Yeah, most currencies that we work in today are backed by nation states of one sort or another, and therefore are backed, in theory at least, by actual real world assets. So, so, but, yeah, but, I did. Cryptocurrencies Trans are not backed by nation states, are they? And and so, so, you know, that's why it, some is, people really like them. You know? <laughs> no, I get that. No, I know, and that's that, so. I get that, but the point was that that was not my. That was not quite where I was going. I was thinking, well, what's the fallback position, right? So, so when the bubble bursts on the U.S. dollar, there are still lots of U.S. assets that you know that exist, right? You have the Federal Reserve, and you have yeah you know, this that and, and this that and the other, and there's infrastructure and, and land and 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 industry, yeah, you know, but. Yeah, you know, if what happens if a cryptocurrency crashes? You can, what's what's it you backed can, by? You can go and buy a Tesla Model X with Bitcoin now, and it is not going to be converted. I can't, I can't afford it. But <laughs> well, I know me neither. But but uh, Tesla if you is, bought a Bitcoin for a couple of hundred bucks, you could. Tesla is yeah, not yeah. converting it back to back to real currency. It is uh, keeping it in Bitcoin. Okay. So uh, there is a there is a shift happening in some areas George, right yeah. now. George Soros yeah. is investing in Bitcoin. They're picking up Bitcoin. It is interesting. It's because, you know, you talk about Christie's and Sotheby's and you talk about the people that pay 68 million for people's JPEG, who are people who actually sit behind the thing and are trying to, uh, you know, are trying to increase the value. They have a vested interest in increasing the value. Tesla, I don't know how I, how I would cynically justify that. Maybe it's just a billionaire playing games. He can afford to lose all the money if he wants to. And, you know, he's just trying new things out because that's who he is. I'm not trying to belittle it completely. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of a, what is, is there any tangibility behind it? Or well, or are we just really early days? And it is the Wild West. And at some point, as you say, Jeremiah, it is coming. We do need to adapt. And over time, it will gain... Um, uh, it, it will gain social acceptance, geopolitical acceptance. It will it will join the shared global myth of money. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it will disintermediate um, uh, in the real estate business escrow companies. I mean, if you you put your house on the market uh, for a certain amount, and the buyer has that amount either in a provable way in their account and you fulfill the contract between you, which is all uh, ascribable uh, in zeros and ones, uh, immediately that money is transferred, the deed is transferred, and the deal is done. Uh, so that's a, a smart contract that I, I believe we're going to start to see those tangible assets that are non-fungible ascribed into the uh, blockchain, and that's going to be very disrupting. That's I think the transparency is the thing that worries governments. I mean, everything is transparent. So you can look at the economics of Bitcoin Ethereum on a daily basis. You can see how many Bitcoins or Ether are in the market, and you can determine how many of them are in a um, 
a, a, a market that is ready to be converted to fiat money or how much of it is going into a fiat money to be converted. And you can, that's just a technical assumption that if somebody's going to be buying a lot of it, that its value is going to go up and selling it, it's going to go down. So there, but all of that transparency is available to any of us, but in the economic terms of our collective countries, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors about how much money is printed, where that goes, how how money is burned, how our economic realities are shaped. And you guys know. Yeah, so, hey, we've been printing money here for years. Yeah, I think I think we are not going to um, to manage to fully explain everything here because um, we are we're just, I have no clue. we're just scratching the surface of this I think it's super <laughs> interesting um, yes we are in a hype curve for sure and uh, things will be shaking around for a while but uh, at least I think we have managed to um, well hopefully at least make people aware of that this is going on if you haven't been uh, reading about nfts well now is the time to maybe dig a bit deeper there and i think with that let's um we're 45 minutes yeah. into the episode let's go and oh, oh wait, I, f at, I feel like we only just started actually yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, we, this, this is this is um this is going to be with us for a while the whole topic yeah so, i mean you know th there's probably another uh episode where we talk very specifically about What is the best way of tokenizing our own work? How, yes. how, is, how do we present our own work in this new marketplace that creates the right conditions for resale, where we get 10% back, which is part mm -hmm. of the overall contracts on these artistic markets? Um, and, and what kind of work is been, has been selling and what is not? Uh, so I, I think there's there's a little bit more room to discuss and and uh, you know I had I had put a few things in the show notes before we go to picks uh, one of of you know people creating fashion <laughs> let, me, let me just bring some of that up here fabricant is is a very very good one uh, the fabricant let me find it so what are they doing Jeremiah uh, you'll see there. <laughs> These are all clothes and clothes designers uh, that are making clothes. They're virtual clothes. You can buy them. You can dress yourself, your avatar, uh, your selfie, uh, your character in the metaverse with these outfits. And so it's fashion without owning clothes. Okay. I think now I can see that. I can that 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 has a yeah, that that's a, a very not new concept, isn't it? I mean uh, and, and I think we will we will see more of that the moment when we begin being more in these virtual worlds with uh, the help of devices that are going to come on the market and that will probably shape the future of computing in a very drastic way. So <sighs> yeah. And then there's only one others that are that I would leave with a complete question mark over my head, and that's the one that says charged FI, <laughs> charged particles. In other words, let's just say we have a basket of NFTs, which we make into another NFT. So oh, they're nesting the <laughs> NFTs. The NFTs are nesting. Okay. Like I said, <laughs> this is a rabbit hole that goes down. I just thought I would leave us with, with that as... As a holy shit. This is This yeah, is for when NFTs really get too difficult yeah. and expensive, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't want to just leave it on the oh we understand everything that's going on. Not really. There, there is so much to learn here and I, I I you know, half of what I've said is probably gonna be to the experts that I'm talking out of my ass. I am no expert at all. I am just trying to learn as much as I can as it applies to our collective art and my own in particular. So And we are all you know, nerds, so I think we have a certain yeah. affinity to this topic. Well, I would consider Indeed. myself a nerd. I know, Jeremiah, you are to a certain extent. Adrian, <laughs> yeah. you'll have to 
qualify I'm that kind yourself. of Luddite nerd. I'm interested in it for the, or a nerd one step remove. I'm interested in it for the application of it right. as opposed to the understanding of it. But um, uh, I, at the moment, I'm uh, yeah, I'm 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 struggling to see the real value behind it. But that doesn't mean that people can't make a lot of money until it. People collapses. isn't struggling. No, not at all. <laughs> no, indeed, indeed. Blau. I mean, you'll see once you kind of Google down, but but. Uh, to that end, and I'll jump in with my pick because it's relevant to what we've we said is um, my pick is is really and you can bring it up uh, really worth watching. Um, it is the greatest NFT film ever made. <laughs> um, this guy ma- did a great job. He has a uh, a website called The Defiant. He's deep into um, blockchain technology and specifically art, but um, it's quite a long, one hour and 22 minutes, and it covers a lot. It's absolutely worth looking at. Here's one of the buyers of uh, Beeple, Tubador. Um, and there you go. Okay, so this is interesting. What would you say this is a bit of a primer for people to... Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very Good. solid primer. Uh, that bears watching with a lean forward point of view. It's not one where you're you're just like glancing at it. It's, <laughs> <laughs> there's a right. lot okay. there. Okay, so um, let me bring up my pick of the week, which is one of the marketplaces. It's called Mintable.app, and uh, it yeah, it 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 might give you a bit of an insight in what the kinds of things are that you can find there. There's um, yeah, it's it's a marketplace, and you can look into I don't know crypto renaissance number two, and then that's an item. Someone's offering this for uh, almost six hundred dollars worth in Ethereum um, or Ether uh, with a description and so on. So so you can you can click around there. You can actually create your own account, create an, your own wallet. Um, and then mint something yourself and just put it on there for sale and see if someone is willing to buy it, which I'd say is probably unlikely, unless it is something that's really, <laughs> that really, I mean, we have to speak about Beeple for one more second because he just, he didn't just put his stuff out there. He had a huge following. He is, um, yeah, he's, he's very a, well known. He is a well known artist. It's not just a, a guy who did some JPEGs and put them out there and, uh, got rich all of a sudden. He has uh, a pretty he, big yeah, body of art, for, body for of work. For 15 years yes. on, on basically gig work for studios and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and, 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 so, and I've, I've followed him for, for many years because he's very adept at what he does and he's yeah. an interesting character. So Oh, yes, he uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last but not least, Adrian, your pick of the week is a piece of hardware. It is something it tangible. Is. Fi- something <laughs> tangible. Yeah, I, I, fi- I finally, finally buckled and bought myself a new laptop. Oh, um, no. And uh, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a lot of photographers say this. I think it's just like the last thing you ever want to upgrade is your laptop because you're too busy looking at cameras and lenses and trips <laughs> and travel and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I yes, I have bought uh, a new MacBook Pro because because I had a MacBook Pro before and I like them. Um, uh, but actually, uh, I've only had it a day and a half and I haven't really given it a thorough testing yet. But just to give you an idea, um, how we record this podcast with... Uh, I, I have effectively one video stream. So my camera is plugged into my laptop and I'm pushing that out to Chris, who records for us. Um, and that, on my old 2014 macbook pro i think it i think in terms of what they call the model it was called a late 2013 model um that was using 80 percent of my cpu just having a couple of browser tabs open and pushing video upstream and if you added um, if you started another app your video would start to break up a bit and yeah 
yeah drop frames and yeah. things like that um, i mean it's a decent enough machine in its day but it wasn't designed to do the sorts of things that we do every day now since the pandemic kicked in you know uh and uh, this new one uh, an initial performance measurement is that it will do all of that same stuff i've just described for only 20 percent of cpu okay just um, just that you so just were frozen for a second there but that might be the network connection <laughs> that was the network connection that has nothing to do with the actual let computer. me take the let me check the activity monitor on my shiny new computer. Actually, it's not that shiny. It's a kind of matte finish. Uh, no, I'm running at about 19. No, no, sorry. 20, just over 20% of CPU. And no, it's no, cold, no, it's to, cold to the touch. Uh, the fans haven't come on, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so... You know, regard, I, I, I don't care really too much about technical specs on these things, um, uh, but what I can say is that, yeah, with a seven-year gap between hardware variants, it certainly is a, a leap forward in performance. And, uh, yeah, uh, just, I'll, 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 if, it, if it all starts to fall apart, I, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. But so far, it's all right. <laughs> okay, congratulations. <laughs> all right. I guess that... That's it for today. Yeah, this might have been one of the more confusing episodes that we've done. <laughs> yeah, no, no thanks to me. <laughs> Sorry, you nearly made me. Sure. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, it certainly confused me. I apologize me. in advance. Uh, uh, in advance. Well, it's not in advance anymore, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. Unless you're one of these <laughs> of people, people who, listening to it. <laughs> unless you're one of these people who flip, uh, who started reading the book from the from the back. Maybe someone's listening to this <laughs> in it reverse made as well. More sense to me. Right. So yeah, we are online, of course. You can find us at uh, the different online outlets and we will um, yeah I, I think we'll try to talk more about art the next time so until then everyone <laughs> take care have a good one bye bye <laughs> bye bye back to the rabbit hole <laughs> yes you've been listening to the future of photography Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Mm -hmm.